<laughs> well, thank you, Catherine. And as Catherine said, my name is Colin. Um, I'm a 20 plus year veteran in the rural metro fire department, and I am assigned to the Knox County Fire Bureau as part of the public education unit as a fire and life safety educator. And then I've also, since 2010, been a fire investigation or a fire investigator um, with the fire investigation task force between the bureau, the fire departments here in the county, and the sheriff's office. Uh, so that's what I do uh, for almost the last 11 years. Um, so today, what Catherine's asking me to do is kind of set the path on emergency preparedness for the topics that I'm going to cover, and then eventually the sheriff's office will be here to talk about some more specific things. But for me, emergency preparedness starts at home. The one emergency that I guarantee that everyone should be prepared for, but never prepares for at all, is the eventuality that the place where they live would catch on fire. We don't like to talk about it. It's scary, and it's awful. It's truly, truly an awful thing. But the truth of the matter is, it happens. Whether it's to make sure that you have renter's insurance if you're renting, or homeowner's insurance is paid up if you have a home, those things are important. It's how you become prepared. So today we're going to talk about some of the things that we need to make sure that we are doing right in our home, and some of the things that we should do as a group, families coming together and practice at least a couple of times a year. The first thing we're going to talk about is the simple fact that as a fire department, we cannot help you until someone calls us. If your home doesn't have working smoke alarms and you do not wake to the sound of that smoke alarm in a fire emergency, but initiate your plan and call 911 for help, it may be minutes before the fire is large enough for someone driving past your home or a neighbor walking by with their dog to see that fire and call 911. And fire doubles in size every minute it's allowed to burn without us doing something to it, right? And, and what's really ultimately scary about all this is this is just an average home in an average house, right? Okay? Just an average room, look, a little, little furry bunny, stuffed bunny in the foreground just to kind of give us perspective. But what we're going to see here is in 48 seconds, this room isn't even capable to survive for even firefighters. 48 seconds. I show this because I really need to drive home that when these smoke alarms go off, you need to leave. Get out, whether that's here in the building, whether it's at home, whether you're out at the mall or movie theater, please know your exit routes, get up, and swiftly, but safely, exit to the exterior of the building and call 911. 48, 48 seconds, that's all it takes. So when we talk about, now that I've scared you significantly, <laughs> okay, <laughs> what does fire need for us to be to be careful. I mean, what do we need to make sure that we're not putting together, right? Ingredients, right? So for those of us that bake, right? I'm a minor baker myself. I buy everything already done. I just break it up in little squares and throw it in the oven, right? But brownies, right? Brownies, cookies, we all love those things, right? But they take ingredients, right? Milk, mix, eggs sometimes, whatever the case may be. Fire is no different. It has ingredients. And they have to come together in order for it to be fire. So in this particular case, it's oxygen in the air that we breathe, fuel, which is anything at this point, right? The tables that we're sitting in front of today, right? The uh, screen, the projection is on. And then heat. Could be anything. Okay? Heat from an operating fireplace, perhaps, or a shorted outlet or an errant candle left burning at night when people sleep. When all these things come together at any one time, there is a potential for fire. So if we were to take any one of those ingredients away, much like, for instance, baking a cake, right? If you don't have the milk, it's not going to be a cake. It's going to be made a pancake. But it's not the cake that you want it to be, okay? We change the mix. We change it. We alter it. We prevent it from becoming what it is. So knowing all these three parts, if we can, as we move about our day, right, 
you see an overloaded electrical outlet, right? It's got two plugs in it, and we stick one of those adapters on there, and now there's eight things plugged into it, right? The refrigerator, and microwave, and, you know what I mean, the game system, the in-window air conditioner, you are waiting for your home to catch on fire, okay? That's overloading an outlet, right? We can see that now and go, man, that's, that's not a good idea. We need to not do that. So every time you can see those things, it reduces virus potential. Right? We'll never make it go away, but we can reduce its potential. Right, right. So, yes, and that's a perfect example. And we'll, we'll dive deeper into that here later in the thing. But yes, exactly. Doing those things is what's going to help. So later today, as Catherine said, you're all going to have an opportunity to work on your own emergency plan, right? Well, we have a minor one, which we call Edith. I hope nobody's named Edith here today. Right? <laughs> I mean, it's a trademark thing, and I don't want to have to, you know, whatever, take for lunch or something. But here's the deal, right? Exit drills in the home. Edith, exit drills in the home. It is our way of planning what we will do in a fire emergency in our home. Right? Where are we going to go? What are we going to do? The routes we're going to take. Right? So, Edith, we want you to practice that twice a year. Right? And I always do this when I have an opportunity to teach kids. I go, we want to do it twice a year because we should have how many ways out of our house at any one time? Two. Two, right? right? So we're going to practice one of each of our ways out at least once a year. So the majority, our primary one, right, for here, right, there's exit doors over here. It's going to take us outside. If you go here and then out the front through the main lobby, you're outside again. We have two paths. And the first path in any one of our homes is upright because things have gone off. Smoke alarms have activated. We get up. There's no smoke. We check the door with the back of our hand. It's not hot. We open the door. We walk out, and we go to our safe meeting place. Yes, ma'am? I have a question. Sure. Ah, we're, we're going to get to that. Absolutely. You know, it's a good question, and I get that. But we'll get, we're going to get that here in just a second. The second plan, which ties into our second story problem, is if your door, sleeping with your bedroom doors closed at night, if you feel that door with the back of your hand and it's hot or it's warm, don't open the door. Take your comforter off your bed, stuff it underneath the bottom of the door, keep that smoke out as best as you can. You're going to need to use your window to get out. So as part of your Edith planning, as everyone comes together to put this plan together, look at your windows. Is it an older house? Has it been painted a bunch of times? Have the windows been painted shut? Can you open them easily? Does it have a screen on it that you're going to have to mess with? Right? If it has a screen on it, the best way to do that when you get it up in there is just push right through it. Because if your house is on fire and your screen, you had to push through it, it's probably going to get replaced by insurance. So push through that screen. Fine. Okay. But make sure your windows are easily operated, that you understand on the outside of your home that it's clear for you to get to. You're not going to fall on top of a you know, thorny rose bush or something. right? Because that's your second way out to your safe meeting place. Safe meeting place being someplace that's away from your home, at a distance, that's going to be safe from the fire, and safe away from where the fire trucks and the firefighters need to operate, but where we can see you when we get there, so we know that you're safe. Because our number one priority is your safety, and if we get there and you tell us that, hey, so-and-so isn't out, I mean, they were, they were in this back bedroom, that's where we're going first. Now let's talk about second stories. I'm not much of a second story man myself. Um, I got into the fire marshal service because, look, I don't fear gravity, but I have very healthy respect for it. <laughs> all right. um, but here's the deal. Second stories present an issue for all of us. <clears throat> if, and a lot of families will say, well, I went out to our home store of choice, and I bought one of those escape ladders, right? I'm going to hook it on there, I'm going to throw it out the window. Climb out like a pirate. Okay, I get that. That's what they're for. But then I ask, have you practiced with it? No, I haven't had it out of the box. Then don't use it. It is completely unnatural, physically, for you to crawl backwards out of your window in the second floor of your home 
at 3.30 in the morning and pitch darkness when you're scared for your life. Your body will not do it. Have you ever tried to put a cat in a bathtub? <laughs> it doesn't want to do it. It doesn't want to do it. Your body will not want to go out that window. That's why you need to practice with it. If you're going to rely on that as your exit route, you need to practice with it and practice often, more than two times a year, with anyone and everyone who may be using that ladder. Because if you've, if you've got children, small children, who may be using this ladder, they're not going to have you to help them. They're going to need to do this by themselves. So they need practice. Right? So, well, we'll get in. If we want to, we can have a discussion about building codes and why buildings that are more than two stories are built a certain way, so that way fire can be contained. That is taken care of as part of construction. We can talk about that after a bit. But, but as far as living in a house with two stories, escape ladders are one way. The other way is to use a phone, have a phone available in your room, and call 911. Call a bunch of times. Tell so, hey, look, I'm I'm in my I'm in my bedroom. I'm on the second floor. I can't get out. I, I, I'm, I can't get out of my room. I'm in my room. I can't get out. Because we're coming for you. That's what we're doing. And when we get there, we will throw ladders, right? And someone will climb up there and carry you down. Right? We've seen it in all the movies. It is what that, that is what it looks like. There's different ways of doing it. Some ways that are more comfortable than others. But yes, we will come and get you. Right? The best thing to do is just barricade that door, shove that blanket underneath the door in that crack there, keep the smoke and the heat out as long as possible, right? Open your window. Understand, though, that once you open your window, not to go into a physics discussion, but you're going to start pulling smoke toward your room because it's now finding a fresh air from you opening the window, right? So know that we're coming. If you feel you have to, I'm not saying this is the way you should do this, but if you try to climb down to a second story or a first story roof, or if you fall out of your window, okay, we're still coming. Right? We're EMTs, we're paramedics, we bring ambulances with us. We will get you to the hospital. Okay? But we're coming. Cool. Exit drills at home. Work together as a family. All right. Make it a family activity twice a year. All right, practice stone fire escape plans. The other important parts of this are if if you've installed supplemental locking hardware on your doors, right? I had a phone call from a distressed father last year whose autistic child um, was now spending more time at home because of the pandemic. And they've had some instances where he has escaped the home and they're trying their best to keep him safe. So he was asking me, hey, can I do this? And I said, sir, absolutely you can. There is no fire code that applies to one or two, one or two family dwellings. But what I would stress to you is, is if you're going to put supplemental locking hardware on your doors, make sure everyone who would need to use that door to get out in an emergency understands how that lock operates, especially if it's a deadbolt up high, and now you've put it out of the reach of someone who may need to use that door. Understand, though, in the particular case of this, Father, he would have to make sure that his son gets out, right? He'd have to be with him. And, and they've already made those arrangements. So secondary hardware is important. All right, we talked about windows. Pathways, folks, right? So you see that I've installed this glorious yellow extension cord this morning, and I got it specifically yellow for cases like this uh, because I, I didn't have duct tape. But I need people to, because it's a trip hazard, right? We want to make sure that the pathways through our home are free of trip hazards and obstructions. Think of it like this. If someone were to call 911 because they're injured, fall, and can't get up, can we get a stretcher to you through your house? And if you look in your hallway and you say no, then how are you going to navigate it when that hallway is full of smoke and it's and you're scared and you're trying to crawl out of there, right? So look, as part of your Edith planning, to make sure that your pathways towards your exits are clear of any slip or trip hazards. All right. Oh my God, that is insane. In the event of a fire, who here thinks that you're safer sleeping with the doors open? I keep them open because I was a mom for so long. My kids' room is too 
doors down from mine. Always open. I'm not all that confident they would stop anything anyway. Harold, hey. Ben. Ben, nice to meet you. Harold, have a seat. Oh, Hi. Nice to meet you guys. Hello. Hello. I'm right here. Chris, how are you? Great. Think about fire safety. What keeps you up at night? Yeah, I'm not too concerned. I probably don't think about a fire threat as much as I should, because I do forget to turn things off often. Have you ever been through one? A fire? No. We told you that you'd be coming here today for discussion, but what we didn't tell you is that there is also a demonstration that we want to show you. Sound good? I want to introduce you to Steve, the director of the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. I'll let Steve take it away. Welcome. My job is to lead a team of people that study how fire grows and spreads so we can keep you safe. Here at the Delaware County Emergency Services Training Center, we essentially turn this place into a laboratory. Uh, we've got several structures around here that we build to simulate where you live. And one of those structures is right here behind me. What I want you to do is I want to take you inside here and I want you to see how this looks like your home. And then once we get you outside, we're gonna go ahead and recreate what would happen if there was a fire in this structure right here. Look pretty normal? Yeah. yeah. Got some furnishings. You'll notice the difference down here as we walk down. This bedroom door will be closed and the one at the end of the hall will be open. And what I want you to do is pay attention to the comparison of the two of those and think about you and your family trying to survive this fire. All right, we just hit the button, we have ignition. Oh boy, there she goes. Oh man, that is scary. It's scary, yeah, right? It's really Thanks. Look, we have wow, smoke coming out over here already. Smoke's coming out. <gasps> what a lot of people don't realize is that the furnishings that are in our homes today are made of synthetic materials. So they burn so much faster than your old natural cotton-filled furnishings used to be. The statistics that we've seen through our research is in about 40 years ago, you had about 17 minutes to get out of your house after the smoke alarm sounded. Now you have less than three minutes. Holy crap, see this is what we're, this is the things that we were. Whoa. Can you feel that? How can you survive that? Seriously, that is insane. All right, go ahead, knock it down. All right, as you remember, closed door on the left, open door on the right. And you can see the dramatic wow. difference between the two with the simple closed door. We want people to be as prepared as possible and understand the importance and how little time you have and what that simple barrier can provide to you and your family should you have a fire. I want you guys to throw some hard hats on and some safety glasses and at least poke your heads in the windows or you can even walk in the hallway if you want. Give me a word or phrase to describe what you just saw. Anxiety. Frightening. Terrifying. I really didn't expect anything like this. I'll ask you one last time. In the event of a fire, are you safe for sleeping with the doors open or the doors closed? Without a doubt, the door closed. Definitely with the doors closed, and from now on, the doors will be shut at night. <laughs> Definitely closed. Closed. Definitely closed. And I'm surprised by it. It's always great to be able to get the message out when we can take our research and get it out into the community to change behavior with the message of close before you doze. It, it feels great, and hopefully we can save lives. If there was one bit of advice that you could give friends or family today, what would it be? Close before you doze. 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 The key fire safety messages we want people to have are, one, have working smoke alarms in every level of your home, inside and outside every sleeping room. We want everybody to have an escape plan. Should you have a fire, you should know how to get out quickly. And if you can't get out quickly, 
having a closed door between you and where that fire is is critical to your survival. All right, so the message is obviously pretty clear. I mean, I'm not going to beat it to a bloody pulp, but we have had fires here in Knox County where having this door, having your bedroom door closed, having the door closed between the attached garage and the house have stopped that fire from either getting into the house or getting into a bedroom that allowed that person time, right? So it's very valuable. It's a good message. It's hard. I, I grew up with my door open. I did. So many things that I came to learn were not the case when I became a firefighter, right? So 20 years ago, I thought fire engines made water. I don't know how that happens, <laughs> what, or what did I know, you know? Um, but we don't, right? And something as simple as your bedroom door as a barrier to fire's progress makes a difference. So now that we have a plan, we understand why we're doing it. Let's talk about some things in our home that we have in there that are going to make sure that we're going to stay as fire safe as possible. What's going to give us our earliest warning? And as and as he mentioned in the video, smoke alarms, right? They're innocuous. There's uh, one over there, one over here. They're all over the place, right? There's one on the table. That, that's not going to work right now because it's not going to anything. But smoke alarms, having working smoke alarms, okay? The important thing to know is, is we want to make sure that we're changing the battery backup that's in it at least one time a year, at least one time a year. If you want to do it too, that's great. It's wonderful at least one time a year. That's just to make sure that it's powered and it will give you that warning in a timely manner when the power is out. Yes? I can't touch you on a smoke detector. All, right, all right. Well, there's here's the deal, right? So this is what I would say, right? Do you, do you live in Knox County or do you live in the city? I live in Knox County. Okay. If you, if you live in the city, then you're going to call 211, right? And you're going to well, call... I live in, in KTVC House. He's in Isabella Tower. Well, and, and that's fine too. You can call 211, tell the operator what your issue is, say, hey, I'm having trouble or issues with my smoke alarms, and they will take your information and transmit it to the city and Oxford Fire Department, and then someone will come and help you. No, I'm saying maintenance has to match with the smoke. We can't touch. I will tell you that if you call 211 and you call the city and the city fire department hears about it, we'll get taken care of. That's their that's their job. That's it goes right to the fire marshal's office. All right. So if you live in the county, obviously, if you go to the Knox County Fire Bureau's website, right, knoxcounty.org/fire, they're right on that home page. There's this little button you click that says "Need help with a smoke alarm." You click it. You fill out the form. It emails my partner and I, and one of us will call you and get you the help that you need. Okay. All right. So we want it as they talked about in the video. One in every smoke, in one in every sleeping room, one outside every sleeping room, one on every floor of your home. Um, that's important. Understand that most homes right now, built prior to 2016, right? They had one outside the concentration of the of the bedrooms on one side of the house or the other, and then one on every floor of the home, right? The best thing you can do is maintain the devices that are in your home. So if they are wired devices where one goes off, they all go off. It's best to maintain those and not replace them with standalone devices. But if you have issues, you call 211 in the city or go to the Fire Bureau's website. We will engage you in a conversation and we will make sure that we figure out what exactly is going to be the best scenario for you going forward. Yes, ma'am. You have a question? Yeah. My smoke alarm is one of those round things that's attached to some kind of a wire thing that's attached to something else in your home. Mm hmm. Okay, when I change the battery in it, you have to like push it on to something that's supposed to like catch on to it and you have to like twist it. Okay. You know? All right. I'm never sure whether I've got that on properly. <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, you're talking about that simple ring bracket, right? You do quarter turn, it comes off, yeah, and it's quarter like turn, it clicks back in again. Like catch on to it. So, okay. you know, when I have an inspection or something, I always get somebody to double check it. To make and that's sure fine. And that's it. fine. Does it hang from the ceiling or is it on a wall? It's on a wall, but it's got some wire thing that the outside part of it is like attached to. Hmm. Curious. Well, 
this is what I would say, and, and I'm, believe me, a lot of things I will say in this presentation are made firefighter proof because they have to work at 3.30 in the morning when we're half asleep. But if, if your smoke alarm doesn't fall off the wall on its own, I'd see that you probably got it attached back the way you need to be. Okay, so as long as it feels right. Like as long as it's secure, yeah. Okay. And sometimes you'll hear a positive click when you click it back into that quarter turn and it snaps back into place. Sometimes it won't. It, depending on how old the bracket is, it may just have lost that snap at spring and stuff. But yeah, I would say if it doesn't fall off the wall, you're you're probably on your way to having a good deal. All right. So the, the next thing is it's important. Now there's new technology coming, right? So in the next 15 years, as they all cycle through. Everyone should then, in 15 years, have a smoke alarm that will know the difference between a house fire smoke and burning hamburgers in a frying pan smoke. Right? That technology is out now. That's awesome, That's right? Thanks, is to, that. thanks to the crew in Oak Ridge, right? At the laboratory in Oak Ridge, they've been working on a lot of smoke alarm technology um, for years, and that's one of the things that's come out of it. But um, we need to make sure that, for now, we are following the manufacturer's instructions and being careful and cautious about how close we install them to anything that creates smoke or steam, like stoves, or outside in the hallway close to our bathrooms if we like to take steamy showers, right? Because those can create errant alarms. And when we have errant alarms, everyone likes to whatever. What, what do they do? You grab a broom, you knock the thing off the ceiling, and you put it in a drawer, right? And that does nobody any good, right? There is, I'm, the drawer is happy that it's protected, right? It's the safest place in the house. But that's not where we live. We don't live in the drawer. We, we live in a house. We need to keep some of alarms up as best as we can. If you're having issues with them because of that, right, again, Fire Bureau's website, 211 if you live in the city. Well, Alan, welcome to my home. I do have smoke alarms here in the house, seven of them, I counted. Uh, but beyond that, I don't give them much thought. I usually just uh, assume they're working well. Right. Installing and maintaining smoke detectors in your home is the easiest and the best way to prevent fire emergencies. And it only takes a minute. But now, are there risks associated with the detectors themselves, and what should I know about these? The biggest risk is not having a smoke alarm or having one that doesn't work they make a huge difference in alerting people that there is a fire in their home. We recommend that you have one on every floor of your home, in the hallway near the bedrooms, one in the kitchen, and one near the furnace. So are there different types of alarms? Yes, there are several different types. You have batteries uh, operated smoke alarms. They are interconnected with wires through your house. The most important thing is having a smoke alarm over not having one. Right, any alarm is better than no alarm at all. Exactly, and what you have here is an interconnected system that's good, but you still have to have that battery backup. Right, but how often are you taking those batteries? I mean, you have to change them still periodically, right? The 10-year batteries, you don't have to change, but every 10 years. The other 9-volt batteries, you need to test the smoke alarm once a month and change that battery every year. Once you take the battery operated off the wall, there's usually a little door on the back, and the battery just comes out. And we do this changing the battery once a year? You change the battery every year, but you want to test the smoke alarm every month. So it's actually pretty simple. You test once a month, change the battery once a year. What else do I need to know? You want to replace the whole unit every 10 years, whether they're electric or battery operated. And a good way to remember that is just to write the date right on the back. Otherwise, you probably would never remember. Would never right? remember. 10 years, long time. All right, so, so 10 years, right? <laughs> so why 10 years? Everybody always asks me, why 10 years, Colin? Why, why can't it be 11? It'd be 12. 12 is a good number. 13 is better, right? Baker's dozens, right? That extra donut. You know, it's like a surprise. It's like a treat, right? No. 10 years is important because the device that most commonly is in our that's in our home, right? An ionizing smoke alarm, has a radioactive element in it. Okay? And that element's half-life is 10 years. And in that time period, as that 10 years expires, its ability to sense that smoke in a timely manner as it's independently tested by folks like UL, um, it, it's not as reliable. It's not going to give you the timely warning that you would expect from it. Okay? So with that said, you want to replace the entire unit. And as you heard in the video, that's whether it's battery operated or it's wired into your home. Okay? Now, new technology being that the sealed 10-year lithium batteries that come with these devices means that you don't have to fool with it at all. There's actually, there's actually economically sense to it that you don't have to keep buying 9 volt batteries. You know what I mean? Poor 9 volt battery is just getting beaten up. You know I mean, first it was beaten up by the AA battery, and now it's getting beat up by the 10 year lithium battery. Poor thing, right? But whatever. Whatever your choice is, the economical choice for your home, you just want to keep up with it, right? Make notes, as they said, write it on the device, 
keep track of that 10 year date and then swap them out every 10 years. My, my maintenance have had to cha change my sport to change either a year or two ago because it roaches ate to the wire. <laughs> and, 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 it, and I will tell you that, that I have seen where small animals, um, uh, especially in the colder months of the year, not that last night was a cold month of the year, but it was darn chilly, um, that they will find attics to live in, right? Raccoons and squirrels and whatever else. And they are drawn to things that are warm. And they learn not to bite certain things because when they bite through an electrical wire, it bites them back, right? Uh, and they usually don't survive that. So uh, there you go. Um, but yes, it, it happens. And you just have to keep up well, on it. I've I reported several times yeah. that they, they, they change the batteries, but they still get beat. Right. So yep. I, they they had to literally take the whole thing off. Yep. They put ten and years. Like, oh, they put ten years. They put one that lasts ten years in. It. Yep, and that's the way it works. And, that, and, and it, so it's dependent on your particular home scenario, right? And that's one of the things that we try to get with interacting with people on the phone is to understand what's going to be best for your your home, right? So to talk about things that we can do as far as smoke alarm technology. Right, we find ourselves here at the Disability Resource Center this morning. Right, so this is an awesome time to mention that we have devices for folks with impairments. Right, right, we have one of my favorites uh, is an alarm clock. Right, it sits on the nightstand, but what it is is a microphone which listens to the temporal pattern of the smoke alarm activating, and when it hears it. It activates a vibrating bed shaker or pillow shaker, depending on where you want to put it, either underneath your mattress or underneath your pillow. And then once that activates, there's this giant message in red neon on the front of the device that screams fire at you. All right. So if you are hard of hearing or you're fully deaf, there's a smoke alarm out there for you. All right. And we have those wonderful relationship we have with the city of Knoxville, and then we take care of each other like this. Okay. Um, there are strobe devices. If anyone's ever stayed in a hotel before and is, and is you know, has the use of the handicap rooms that are there, you'll notice the smoke alarm is supplemented with a strobe device. Those aren't just for commercial occupancies. We can put them in your home, right? We have access to that. Okay? You just need to let us know what your needs are, and we will do our best to make sure that everyone, regardless, has access to the proper warning for their home. <laughs> if you wanted to buy one on your own, a typical strobe device, the ones that we buy are, are somewhere in that $250 per unit price. Um, but I usually like to horse trade for stuff, right? So I'll find somebody who's got some like that, uh, and then I'll see if they need something. So sometimes we can kind of work together as fire departments, and that's why we have a wonderful relationship with the City of Knoxville Fire Department, um, our counterpart at the city. Um, we take care of each other because the mission is everyone needs to be protected. There is no reason why in the second decade of the 20th century, 21st century, that we should have anyone ever die in a house fire. That, that is one thing in the that is not that model in my book, but it, the one I have, has, they, I think they told me to also put their car for their mouth. Right, and, and they do have those units too. And we'll talk about, ironically, which is the next topic, is carbon monoxide. If you use gas to heat your home or cook, or you use a fireplace with a burning stove, right, you need a carbon monoxide device in your home. Carbon monoxide is a natural byproduct of combustion that happens whenever you burn anything, right? But if the device is working properly, it's maintained correctly, and it's burning efficiently, the carbon monoxide that it creates is burned off as part of its operating process. If it is not maintained, your furnace element is not working correctly, right? Your fireplace is excessively dirty. That carbon monoxide is going to accumulate at dangerous levels. So we need a device like a smoke alarm that's going to sense the carbon monoxide. And it can kill you. Yes, in longer terms, yes, absolutely. It is dangerous, and it can be. So now, with codes and everything, um, we have standalone carbon monoxide devices, and then we have combination smoke alarm devices that also have carbon monoxide detectors in them as well. My home is built in 2018. Uh, the 2018 code requires that there be at least a wired 
carbon monoxide device inside the home. So it's a combination device. And I have two of them. I've discovered the other day because they take not nine volt batteries. They actually take double A batteries, two of them. So um, understanding that, and those are there, and those are devices designed to talk to you because they're two different alarms, two different patterns, two different sounds you'll make. So following that sound as it activates, it will tell you fire or carbon monoxide emergency, right? So that you understand which emergency that you're dealing with. In either emergency, you need to get out of your house. Call 911, tell them what's going on, and if you are having a carbon monoxide emergency and you have gas service, make sure you let the dispatcher at 911 know that so they can activate the utility provider, like KUB, maintains a specific responder for those emergencies. Um, and they will also be sent to your home to help us, the fire department, figure out what's wrong. Yes, ma'am. My daughter, the apartment she's in is on the ground floor, but it was built 2008. Mm -hmm. and in her bedroom, she has a little red box on the wall. It's not a box. It's actually flat with a wall. Mm -hmm. And it slips in it. Sure. What is that? I would say that that's probably a speaker. I, I would say it's probably a speaker for the fire alarm system. Okay. The apartment building probably has its own fire alarm. And those components are usually labeled red. Um, something like that would very rarely be a carbon monoxide. I've never seen one. Okay. Like that. So, but yeah, I would say it's probably a speaker part of either a public address system or when the fire alarm activates in a common area, it may communicate to all the apartments within that one building at the same time to alert the occupants that there's a fire that's not occurring inside the apartment building. If you're inside, inside their specific unit, <coughs> so more than likely it's a speaker, I would say. The one thing to do, and I find myself doing this quite often, is abusing Google, right? This is not a product reference, but I, I give Google lots of crazy questions, right? And inevitably, it will spit it up. So I bet if you put red outlet plate with, with holes in it in my wall, it'll probably spit something out. At least look at the images, and as you go through the images, you'll probably see one, and then you'll say, oh, yeah, that's it, and then you'll click on it. I've probably got a quarter somewhere in a couch that I bet that that's probably what that is. Can you also take a picture with Google Lens that. What's that? You Google Wiz. You know, and I've heard about that. I, I I have to admit, at 48, I'm not super techie. You, you all saw me set up all this stuff this morning, but, <laughs> but you know, I mean, I have not used Google Wiz yet. But I, I do understand that you can do that, though. You just use your phone, you, you show it, and it tells you what it is. I don't, you know, I mean, that's that's yeah. So carbon monoxide devices. If you have carbon monoxide needs in your home for a device, if you have more than one story, please have one on every floor of your home. All right, fire extinguishers, right? This is the next thing we need to have in our house in case we have a fire emergency. I would encourage you to have one, understand how it gets used. This is one of the things that we've talked about in some other meetings um, where I can come back once we are um, a little less restricted as far as uh, contact and distancing. And I can spend a few hours out here in the parking lot and just let people use a fire extinguisher, right? Super warm day. Some more canopy, may have some drinks, and, and we can do that. Okay? It's a great little activity. Everyone should understand how a fire extinguisher operates. You're never going to know how to do that until you use one. Okay? So that's kind of a cool part of my job. I can help you do that. Okay? So a typical two and a half pound fire extinguisher, like the one here on the table, this is the one that we're going to have, and I, and I would gather the majority of people in this room. This device is underneath the sink right next to your stove. All right? Don't raise your hands. I don't want you to embarrass yourself. <laughs> because if I was in your place right now, 20 plus years, I would raise my hand. That's where I put it, right? No. Please don't. Right? What I want you to do, if you were to have a fire emergency at home, is I want you to retreat to an area where it's safe, right? Where it's safe, where you can call 911 and start getting help, okay? Whether that be in a front hall closet, some place that's convenient to the kitchen, where more than likely it's the number one place in America still that we have fire emergencies. We retreat to safety, we grab the fire extinguisher, and then we approach it to use it from a safe distance. Okay? Do not run toward what's on fire the stove to get to the cabinet where the fire extinguisher is. Don't do that. It's not a good idea. Okay? All right. This device 
in that size has a five foot effective range. In other words, you're going to need to be within five feet of what's on fire to use that device in order to make it work and put that fire out. <coughs> now, safety speech. Folks, use your gut. Finely tuned diagnostic tool, right? Chicken or fish for dinner, what routes we drive home when it's when it's garbage weather out, okay? Right? What lottery numbers we play. Obviously, everyone in this room, right? Bad at picking lottery numbers, right? <laughs> it's cool though. Yeah. Now, my accountant says that though I'm independently wealthy, I need to still work. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, use your gut. If there is a fire in your home and your gut says, I need to get out, you need to go outside and do that. Go outside and wait for us. Tell us what the emergency is. Tell us what's on fire. We will come and we will put that out. Across Knox County today, there are tons of firefighters waiting on the edges of their seats for you to call them. They're going to hate you for that. That's the truth. <laughs> we have the best job in the world. We sit around. We don't sit around every day. We have lots of things that we do every day. But we don't work unless someone's having a bad day. And I don't want anybody to have a bad day. It's part of our All right. So there you go. Fire extinguishers. Okay. If you don't know how to use it, but you have it in the house, when it's a, when your house is on fire, it's not the time to learn how to use it. Remember, go with your gut. All right. Alert! Before using a fire extinguisher, ensure that someone notifies the fire department, alerts others about the fire, begins evacuating others from the premises. Fire extinguishers are for controlling small fires before they have a chance to spread. Before using one, make sure that you have a clear escape, you are familiar with the operating instructions of the fire extinguisher, and that the fire extinguisher you have is suitable for the fire you're facing. Before using the extinguisher on a fire, look at the fire class symbols on the front label to make sure the extinguisher you have is suitable for the type of fire you're facing. The most common classes of fires are A, B, C, and K. Class A fires involve common combustibles like wood, paper, and tires. Class B fires involve flammable liquids like gasoline and petroleum oil. Class C ratings involve energized equipment or things that are plugged in like appliances, computers, televisions, and electric machinery. Class K fires involve cooking oils and greases like vegetable fats. Once you've determined that the extinguisher is the correct type for the hazard, proceed to operate the extinguisher using the PASS technique to control and extinguish the fire. First, hold the extinguisher upright and pull the pin. Next, stand 8 to 10 feet from the fire and aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. Do not get too close or aim the nozzle too high. Once the nozzle is aimed at the base of the fire, squeeze the levers together to begin discharge of the fire extinguishing agent. Maintain your distance from the fire and sweep the nozzle from side to side, sweeping 3 to 6 inches beyond the right and left edges of the fire. Discharge the extinguisher until contents are exhausted to prevent reignition. Move around the fire to confirm it is completely extinguished. Your quick action can save lives and protect property. Using the fire extinguisher properly is only one part of a fire safety plan. For more information and training videos, go to www.femalifesafety.org. Alright, okay, so to bring us back a little bit full circle and then to kind of segue into what you did you're all going to do for the remainder of the day, right? Let's talk about our plan again, all right? So we talked about Edith earlier, right? Having that plan, we're going to practice twice a year, right? Here at the Disability Resource Center, they have a disaster plan, an emergency plan. So the alarm goes off, their staff that will react and help us get outside the safety, right? Make sure that we're okay. But what about the house? Or what if I, I work here, right, at the mall, and all of a sudden I forget our plan, right? In that moment, what do I do? I'm gonna ask you to remember the acronym RACE. Rescue, alarm, contain, and extinguish. Four easy letters, because I want you to race to safety, right? Seven posts, that's my Heisman post, all right? <laughs> okay, race to safety. Rescue, alarm, contain, extinguish. So here we go, here's the plan, in a nutshell, right? Rescue yourselves and who you are with, from danger point A to safety point B. Traditionally, safety point B, hint, hint, outside, 
Okay? As we are moving to safety point B, we're going to A, sound the alarm. We're going to call 911. And don't necessarily say, oh, okay, so and so's calling 911, so I don't need to call them. No. Everybody call. You mean dispatchers are going to hate me for that. This video eventually is going to wind up on Fire Bureau's YouTube. I know there are some dispatchers in Knox County that follow the YouTube channel. They're going to hate me for this, but that's okay. Everybody call. The more people that call, the more information we get, the better prepared we are as a fire department. Sheriff's Office is more prepared because they're more than likely going to beat us 90% of the time to provide that initial help that we all need to kind of keep everything flowing in a nice, evenly manner. Okay? The more information we have, the better we can deal with the problem, right? Alarm. Sound the alarm. Call 911. And then as we are moving, right, to safety point B, we are going to see contain. And we're going to close the doors we pass through, right? Just like in the UL video, we're going to put that barrier to fire's progress in between us and the fire on the way out. That's going to help us as a fire department battle room and contents fire as opposed to an entire structure. And then when all those things are being done, we eventually arrive at E for extinguished. Now you're going to say, oh my gosh, well, that's, that's going to take forever. No, no, no. I'm not saying they have to have, have I mean, everybody has to be outside and they get a fire. You're saying, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is all these things can be happening all at once. But they are a priority, right? Get ourselves out, call for help, close the doors. All these things are happening at the same time. And then you go get your extinguisher and return to where the fire is. And if at that point you have the right extinguisher for the right fire, that fire is rated for that size fire. In other words, this is how we do it. Super easy. Again, firefighter proof, right? Smaller the fire extinguisher, smaller the fire it can put out. Okay? This two and a half pounder that we have in our house, right? It wants to put out stuff. It's only designed for stovetop fires. Or maybe a small rubbish container in a bathroom or an office. Okay? That's it. If your favorite chair is on fire, it would love to be able to put it out. It just can't. It's just not designed to. Remember, smaller the fire extinguisher, smaller the fire it's able to put out. And then tie it back into our 48 seconds that we started the evening with, or the morning with, okay? Right? Fire doubles in size every minute it's allowed to burn without us doing something to it. So as long as the time progresses, it's just going to get bigger, right? So let that gut tell you, even if you arrive back with your extinguisher, and now it's bigger than what you found it before, and you've got says, no, it's time to go. We'll see you outside. Okay? Trust me. Make sure your homeowner's insurance is paid off. Make sure you have renter's insurance. There's absolutely nothing inside a building that is worth anyone here. Okay? Please, get out. Give us something to do. Just saying. All right. So rescue alarm, contain and extinguish. That is a plan that we can have in the absence of everything that we can remember. Okay, rescue alarm contain extinguish. All right, electrical hazards, just to wrap up a few quick things, make sure we talked about it earlier. Don't overload outlets. If you need more plugs where you are, use a ground fault protected power strip. You'll see here today that I'm using one to power my stuff, right? Use only the outlets that are provided on the power strip. Leave the other outlet in the wall empty. Okay? That will put the least amount of strain on your home's electrical system. Home heating. We are coming out of home heating season. Whew. Right? Get to open the windows some days and not have the air conditioner on. It's awesome. As long as pollen isn't out. Okay. <laughs> that, that yellow stuff that paints our cars every morning. All right. Home heaters, right? When we use them in the colder months, make sure you give them three foot of distance from anything combustible. Okay? That's drapes, that's bedding, that's furniture, that's anything that can catch on fire. <clears throat> Needs that three feet. Okay? Never, ever, ever use a portable heater on an extension cord. They are not rated for that. It needs to be plugged directly into the wall. Make sure you follow the manufacturer's listed instructions. Okay? All right. If you have small animals, if you have children that come, rambunctious, rowdy children, to visit your house often, there are features, anti tip features. That if it gets knocked over, it'll shut itself off. Find the one that's going to work best for you. Kitchens and cooking safety. Folks, I will tell you that this is nationally the number one place we have to worry about fires 
in her house. But here, trivia question. Catherine's saying that y'all are going to have trivia. I'm going to have my own trivia question. No, that's fine. Does anyone know, since we're this far along in the presentation now, does anyone know the top three reasons why we have fire in the United States? Because Tennessee is Tennessee is just the same as the rest of the country. Not, people not watching how what the cooking and okay. the cooking. Okay. Cooking is and cooking and is a good one. Grease fires. Grease fires. Someone always has the smoking one, right? So I'll throw that one out there. What's another one? We talked about it before everything started. For those of you that were early, candles, right? Dryers, right? Okay. All that is true. But more to the point, the top three reasons that we have fires, Tennessee and the rest of the United States, men, women, and children. Right? I know it sounds completely silly, but but we all do things. Right? We accidentally do XYZ. The lady from the UL video, I, I happen to leave things on all the time. I mean, it's great that she'll admit that. That's wonderful. I'm proud of her for doing that. Right? But I mean, before I was a firefighter, I would Leave the dryer running and go to the go to the store. Good gracious sakes, you know what I mean? Come on, that's not smart. Don't do that. Please don't do that. Okay. So think about the things we talked about today, right? When we talk about the fire tetrahedron and what we need to keep apart from each other and reduce that fire potential. But in the kitchen, we never want to leave cooking alone, ever, right? Don't start frying your your French fries and then. Leave the house, go next door, and get your kids and tell them it's their time. We have phones, we have windows, open them up, yell. Right? Don't leave your cooking unattended. Right? Um, if you're going to use something to smother that fire instead of a fire extinguisher, if you don't have a pot lid, a cookie sheet is perfect for that. It gives you standoff distance from the fire and it covers everything that it goes on top of. Right? It's a wonderful little tool. And folks, for the younger Folks in the crowd, we're talking like little tiny guys, and then our older crowd, um, microwaves. They're wonderful tools, but we need to be very, 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 very careful, especially those ones that are over the stove. Make sure that you can get things out of it without catching that lip on the tray or on the device, that you run the risk of trapping that pot and then everything's spilling on it, right? It's, it's a scary way to get a very dangerous skull injury, okay? So be careful with your microwaves, too, okay? All right, additional resources, because it, it's a disability resource center. So if I don't come at you with resources, then it looks like I wasn't prepared today, right? So here are some great things. The Home Safety Council is great. Ready.gov um, is a wonderful website resource. Um, zombie Apocalypse Plan, right? It's the truth. There is one on there. And you can find it, right? It is awesome. Now, it has nothing to do with zombies, but but they call it that because it teaches you to be prepared for you know four or five days of a climactic injury or emergency where the power goes out. You know, I mean, do you have enough dog food for your pets? Um, do you have enough medicine um, in case you know, you're running out? Do you have stuff? Zombie apocalypse plans, just a very generic plan, but it gets people to go to ready.gov because they don't believe me. And you'll go, and you'll be like, oh my gosh, come on, you're right. And now I know about emergency planning. It's awesome. And of course, just to, to kind of hype myself, Knox County Fire Bureau's YouTube channel, uh, if you were ever interested in watching me change the hose <laughs> off the back of your dryer, right, because it's important that we do that. We <laughs> take that off the wall, and we clean that often, right? But if you're ever curious as to how that works and what that looks like, there's a video of me doing that. So it's awesome. Yes. How often should we? Oh, and that's a great question. <laughs> and the answer is I don't know. But here's the deal: you should do it as often as you feel you need to, right? Based on your usage, because what will happen, and this is the first thing that you'll notice when you need to start cleaning that out, you'll have to start using your dryer more than once to dry what's in there. If you go to open that dryer, it's done, and things are still damp. And you're like, that's kind of peculiar and you throw them in a second time, what you should be thinking is, is that that hose that's exhausting that lint to the exterior of your house may start getting clogged at that point, and it's not exhausting that heat properly. And when it's not doing that, it's not leaving the heat inside the dryer, which is not working correctly. That's your first cue, right? But you should be doing it on a regular interval. Upside of this is most of our licensed chimney sweeps in this area 
that work here in the Knoxville area, um, they've started doing this role too, right? So there is someone that you can call if you're not capable of doing it on your own, or if you've got, let's say, for instance, a, a senior relative or a parent who uh, is still living on their own and thriving, but they can't do that on their own, right? You can call and you can have someone go and help with that. All right, that's awesome. It's a very good question. It's a very good well, question. What about yes. the chargers, like the phone chargers, computer chargers that are plugged in but nothing's hooked to it? And mm. the chargers are hanging there. Okay, <laughs> there's two schools of thought on that. I will tell you that if you if you plug something in to charge it, and it's currently charging, that's amazing. It's great. It's what's working. But if it's no longer charging, unplug it. It doesn't need to be plugged in anymore. Now. One school of thought would say there's no pull on it, there's no draw because it's not actually the device to plug in. Well, there's something in the outlet, and the outlet knows that something's there, and it, it all that's all it knows. It knows to put electricity to it. So now at the end of that charge cord, it's live. So coffee pods and things like that, they should be disconnected also. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. Something like that that's off. It has a switch, right? right. It's yes. generally off. No, I'm not worried about those. But yeah. say for instance, because this has happened, folks. Um, you'll get a cord that will wind up errantly falling. I mean, somebody will charge it on nightstand and it will lay on top of it, and if there's an issue, I have read about cases where they blame fires that have happened on bedding on just the general cord hanging out there, right? That's why you should never charge your phone on anything that's not a non-combustible surface, right? Do it away from your bed. Do not charge your phone and use it in bed. Don't fall asleep with your phone, like I find my 15-year-old every now and then, right? I do that because a lot. Because for those of us that remember the cell phones that were blowing up, right, the Samsungs, okay, um, a lot of that was some, some manufacturing issues, but some of that was brought to light for the fact that people were sleeping with them and they would get underneath the pillow or underneath the comforter, and that heat that all cell phones generate is not able to dissipate correctly, and the one thing that that heat then will affect and damage is the battery. And once the battery fails, it fails violently, and it results in a fire. So you need to be careful. So I would say that if it's something that you're charging, um, like a laptop or a cell phone or a uh, portable light, something like that, once it's done charging its cycle, unplug it. Unplug it. It doesn't need to be plugged in. Okay? That's my opinion. Yes, sir? When I'm at home, I always keep... Well, this is what I would tell you, um, just because I've had lots of laptops like this, um, the battery needs to function on its own. If you're constantly charging it and you're not giving it a chance to exercise itself, right, in other words, use the power that's stored in it to depletion and then charge it back up again, its ability to maintain that charge goes away. Okay. Lithium battery technology is improving by leaps and bounds every year, but the problem is is that you're not giving that battery a time for it to operate oh. for itself. So charge it until it's charged, take it off charge, unplug it, use it, enjoy it. It's a wonderful device, that's why we have them. And then when it's needing charge, charge it right back up again. Just make sure it's always charging on a non-combustible surface, please. Not are there any questions from anybody that's uh, in the chats? You mean, I, I mean, I know we're also partially zooming this too, which is pretty cool. There, is, there are not any questions. Is, is everybody awake? I think this is awesome. Oh, everybody! Uh, there is a, a mom and two younger kids. So that's awesome. They're listening in. That's awesome. Well, you know, mom with the younger kids. Thank you. If you go to the YouTube channel, lots of. Uh, fire station tours, lots of apparatus tours. One of my favorite videos. We go out on the uh, the rescue squad's boats and a day on the lake with a boat. Um, so there's lots of stuff on there on the on the fire viewers uh, uh, YouTube channel. We are 113 subscribers away from breaking a thousand. Oh wow! They've already started to put commercials on my stuff. It's like crazy when you think about it. And, and I'm kind of I'm kind of proud of kind of simple to it, mostly because folks like Disability Resource Center, the Office on Aging, CAC, um, they have participated in a lot of these programs, right? And, and as a partner, right? The sheriff's office has done some stuff with us. Um, yeah. And it's just great. So our channel would not be what it is and be as cool as it is without all of our partners. So 
Uh, folks, um, barring any other questions, I know that y'all are going to start throwing paper wads at you, but um, secret is plan your plan, work your plan, practice it twice a year, two ways out, make sure you're sleeping with your doors closed at night. It's going to take some practice, especially if you're not used to it. It's going to feel weird. I want to get a word bit. Oh, well, I mean, if you don't have a better door, you have a better door. But, but if you do, I would urge you to try it, please, right? Every one of our kids, right, when we're out in school, they practice fire drills all the time, okay? For those of us that are teaching at home, practice fire drills at home, right? Twice a year. Well, let's see. And Nathaniel, I'm sure... Isabella Towers and those of you who live in KCDC, they have to have plans already. You can yep. ask your apartment manager yep. what the plan is. If your apartment yep. building catches on fire, what are you to do? Yeah. And yeah. if they don't I have one, have then tell them to call the fire department. Because they, we had an issue uh, with stuff in front of my windows, and I talked to Beverly, my Section 8 worker, and she said that I had to have certain stuff moved so far away from the windows and stuff yeah. in case of that. Yeah. That's part of the section eight inspection. Yeah. 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 So yeah. yeah. There's there's a there's a lot of there's, there's a lot of fire code inspections that go into that. Yeah. Um, and yeah. that is that is a code requirement for the federal government's second so qualifying stuff. So yes, there's a lot of stuff into that because it's public. Yeah, it's a make to I don't have nothing blocked, but there's some. I, I have two windows that open. Mm -hmm. I have a, one of my dressers and some stuff by I can still open it. Yeah. But I have to move thing out. But I have one window where my bed's at, but it's not in front of the window, but I can open it. Yeah. It, I, live on the, I live on the fourth floor of my apartment. Yeah, I would tell you that your building is designed to not necessarily have your second way out be. Um, the window. The window. Yeah. Um, when we start to talk about buildings like that and the codes that are involved and the way the building is constructed, um, we could spend all day talking about compartmentalization. <laughs> um, but there are certain building materials that go into how that building is going to survive a fire different than a one and two family dwelling, like a residential house or a condo or a townhouse. They pretty much told me that pretty much I asked them about the windows and stuff because I have a table on there. I basically I would have to I'm on top of the table and climb out the window. <laughs> well, I, I, I would prefer, I obviously, I mean, everyone's homes are going to be set the way that they like them to be, but I would never want you to have to move things in an emergency. The window should just be open. But hey, now, this, is, I'm sorry, this is what we're going to do today. Yep, right. yep. But yeah, 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 yeah we're going to you're gonna give some thought to that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So when it comes to specifics, that's what we'll do at the end of the lesson. All right. So. Anything else? If not, I think that I have blown up my time. <laughs> and you, uh, for those of us that were online joining us today, thank you, everyone, uh, for coming out today. Thank you to the Disability Resource Center for having me today. And uh, I'm going to hang out for a little while. So right. if after thank all this you. is done, if there is something that comes up, then we can talk about that. So. We'll give you a hand. Thank you. And we'll put, um, we'll put some of those pictures on our Facebook. Yeah, yeah, too. yeah. We're so, gonna we're gonna get that taken care of. Yeah. All right. That's Wonderful. Great. Thank you, Colin. All right. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. With that said.